accounts and uh, for former customer and there is need of audits and audits and more audits and we 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 have to to carry the the the, the, the amount of uh, of each audit it could be a very big amount of money and we will not be able to to work with this so I, maybe we need some more explanation on this, or, or maybe there is more uh, um, constraints to put on this in, in order to, to be sure that the small companies will not be uh, uh, penalized. Or... Yes. Great. Thanks very much. Let's hear next from Evangelos. Uh, what are your expectations for obligations for small providers? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and inviting Anissa to participate in this panel. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm not a, a competition expert. I'm not uh, the, the person that will give you insights on co-investment, but I will focus mostly my contribution on uh, the security and the resilience of networks. Um, Code is, a, is a, actually an evolution of the previous telecom uh, framework, and um, it brings some new elements uh, regarding the cybersecurity and the resilience aspects of it, and we welcome this. We have um, worked for many, many years with telecom uh, regulators, the NRAs, uh, from 2009, even before, actually to implement the famous Article 13A notification obligation, and we have um, managed to develop a, a fairly harmonized approach to the collection of data. We, on an annual basis, collect data and statistics, and we issue annual reports that explain a little bit, you know, what are the root causes of the major out outages in Europe. And this was a very good uh, experience, not only for uh, the telecom regulators, but for us, and I think for the whole Europe, and um, I should say that it has inspired the Commission to actually copy some of these ideas in uh, new regulations like, for example, the NIS Directive or the EIDAS. Um, so we have seen a, a big progress done over the years in terms of uh, resilience, in terms of security, and we collaborate a lot with uh, um, private uh, companies, big players, but also small players, to understand exactly the needs. And um, we have developed a, a couple of uh, good practices um, that, and we help uh, private organizations more or less to deploy these good practices. Um, we have seen uh, in an impact assessment that we have done a year ago that the majority of the players in Europe actually have implemented one way or another with uh, the, the practices that we have proposed. Um, with the code now and the new developments, um, first of all, we see an alignment with the NIS directive, which is, in my opinion, very important. This is important because um, the networks are used not only for offering commercial services to end users and small businesses, but they are services which are used for other critical operators like banks, energy companies, and so on. And the NIS directive and actually left an open uh, gap with respect to the telecom uh, with this famous code of uh, Lex Specialis. So now code comes and brings um, an alignment, and this helps a lot. Um, one of the benefits of this alignment is that in the future uh, the incidents that will be reported will not cover only availability, but they will also cover confidentiality and integrity, and this gives us more scope. It will give us more insights as to what makes networks actually fail. Um, we will be able to identify the root causes, to identify, you know, what was the reason, and give more uh, visibility uh, to decision makers, you know, about the, the, uh, the hygiene or the health of, the, of these networks. That, that's that's a, a very good uh, development. Um, we work already with the uh, NRAs. We have a constant dialogue, and we are already in anticipation of the final version of the code, so I'm happy to hear that the trialogue develops well. So as soon as there is a final uh, statement, 
we will uh, try to understand uh, how we can play a role and what role can we play, and then we will uh, take it forward, you know, with NRAs and uh, the telecom operators. Um, concerning the, the small companies, um, unfortunately, in terms of security, always the small companies, and especially the telecom operators, the small uh, operators are the weakest link, are companies that do not have the financial means to protect themselves. They don't have, you know, the appropriate expertise and knowledge. They are not able to deploy a very big, sophisticated, you know, team. And uh, it is always difficult, you know, to comply with the latest, you know, cybersecurity good practices and state of the art. Uh, and NISA as an organization realizes this and has already developed good practices. So what we do is we collect a lot of practices that are used by big players and we try to customize them to the needs of the, of the smaller players. We will continue doing this, hoping that some of these practices can be easily applied. Um, this brings a lot of knowledge to smaller players quickly, but I know that, you know, from the theory to praxis uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of investments. And um, as an EU agency, it will remain at the disposal of, uh, of smaller players, ECTA and the members of ECTA, to help them and others, of course, to help them, you know, uh, implement in the smoothest possible way, you know, the things that we, we recommend. So, again, thanks again for your invitation. I'm happy to contribute to the discussion further. Great. Thanks very much. Next, here, let's hear from uh, Katie. What is your perspective on what these changes will mean for small providers? Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, and, and first, also let me uh, start by thanking uh, the Green Group uh, for inviting Digital Europe uh, to speak at this event. Uh, I might also just start by uh, introducing Digital Europe as an association for those who don't know Digital Europe. Uh, we represent 60 corporate members and 37 national trade associations, so we are a very broad, a very big uh, association representing the ICT and the digital industry in Europe. Uh, our overall aim is, of course, to nurture and, and to have EU policies that nurture and support the digital uh, tech industry and innovation so that Europe can prosper from the jobs and the economic and the societal benefits that we believe ICT technologies and digital transformation will bring. Uh, as uh, an association and the, the, the specific working group uh, that I chair in Digital Europe, we've been following the code from this sort of very broad perspective. Uh, from, from its inception, uh, from uh, the very beginnings with the public consultation back in, in 2015. So it's been a very long road. Um, and I think, you know, looking back when, when we started this work and, and what we wanted, what we sought as Digital Europe, was very much an opportunity to really take a, a, a fresh think, a rethink of what is it we need, what are what have the technological developments been uh, since, since uh, the 2009 framework review? Uh, where are the market structures today? Uh, and, and what do we still need to foster innovation, to foster a very dynamic ecosystem? Because really that's, you know, that's the way we see We don't look at it just like, oh, this is the telecom sector, this is something niche, and this is something very narrow. No. I mean, as the industry, we represent really the whole, the whole value chain. Um, so you'll have companies such as Cisco, which is a traditional uh, telecom equipment uh, vendor, and you'll have consumer electronics, you'll have a lot of communication service providers. So really we look at it from this broad picture, and what we wanted was a more targeted, what we thought could be a more targeted, more simplified, and, and most of all a more harmonized framework, right? Because the point is that actually with technological innovations and developments, what we're seeing is more and more technology breaking down what traditionally have been very national markets. And so we felt that the time was actually ripe to really take a leap forward and to facilitate a framework that would really foster the digital single market. And that was also very much the aim, right? This is a digital single market proposal. Um, what, what, what will it be? What will the economic landscape be as a consequence of the code looking at it from that perspective? And you know, I think we have to be uh, honest, um, albeit, of course, recognizing the tremendous effort that has been put in, that when it comes to these specific issues around services, around security, actually we, 
we don't see that we're making that, that big progress. There are some improvements, uh, like, for instance, more of an alignment with the NIS directive, which is definitely to be welcomed. But we still see that there's been a, a quite sort of timid uh, approach to really have a fresh rethink of what is needed, which kind of rules are needed, and where are the real issues, where are the real bottlenecks, where are the real, um, for instance, when we're talking about the end user rights, where are the real consumer rights issues? Um, so one of the things, and, and it was already mentioned by uh, Ms. Mr. Villeville as, as well, actually one of the issues is that we keep talking about end users, but what is end users in this sector? It's so broad. And then when you read the specific provisions in, in what is Title III, I'm sorry to get a little bit too nitty-gritty now maybe, um, it's really very much written with a, a, a specific set of consumer issues, and it doesn't take into account that you have the business market as well, for instance. So one of the things that we've been saying is you need a distinction between B2B and B2C, just as one example, right, to make it a bit more manageable and a bit more aligned to what the real needs are in the market. Uh, another issue that we've been saying around end user rights but also around uh, security is that we need maximum harmonization. We understand that when it comes to something like access regulation, um, <clears throat> maybe you still need it to be a directive, you know, maybe there's still a, a sort of local anchoring. But really when we're talking about services today, we don't understand why it can't be a regulation. We can't understand why it can't be maximum harmonization because these issues, whether we're talking about consumer rights protections or whether we're talking about security, objectively speaking, the needs are the same. I mean, there isn't a, you don't secure a digital communication service or a network. The best case practice isn't different, whether the network is in Denmark or in Spain or in Belgium, and it's the same for, for the consumers. And so what we're seeing today is, despite the fact that, as I was mentioning before, there is this positive uh, alignment with, with NIS, but as opposed to NIS, this is very much minimum harmonization. So yes, we will have implementing regulations, which are welcome, um, and, and INISA hopefully will get a very important role in, in helping uh, developing those. But then member states are free to implement, to, to impose additional obligations. And this isn't, you know, this isn't about what's the right level, what's, you know, how stringent or non-stringent should requirements be. That's not what this is about. We have an EU implementing regulation, and that should be the, the regulation that should be the one place where you go as a provider, whether you're small or large, ECS, ECN, both, whatever. You should just be able to go one place, see these are my obligations, and not understand. So there, are, there is the implementing regulation. And then on top of that, I need to understand, you know, times the amounts of European markets are in. I have to also then go and understand what's the exact national transposition and any potential additional national obligations. And it's the same with, with all of the end user rights provisions. It's potentially the same with emergency calling obligations, where you also don't necessarily are, are going to have harmonization. And so we think this is a problem, right? And we think it's a problem in particular for smaller players, um, where if you're a big player, uh, and, and, you know, the industry represent both large and small. If you're a big player, we don't like it, but we probably will be able to deal with it. But if you're a small player, well, again, it's, it's very difficult. So you have to consider that some of these additional compliance costs actually potentially can become a market access barrier. So what we're seeing, what we're fearing a little bit, is that we've missed the opportunity to create a real um, genuine digital uh, single market. So I've probably already uh, spoken too long, uh, but I'll be happy to uh, elaborate and deep dive on some of these issues. Thanks a lot, Katie. So let's um, finally go to Panayotis, who I believe has a PowerPoint presentation as well. Yes, sorry for having a PowerPoint presentation. Can we go to the first slide? Uh, actually, I'm not a legal expert. Uh, I cannot offer technical uh, uh, opinions and arguments about, uh, but what I understand is some of these regulations that we're discussing here might hinder the operation of community networks that uh, we discussed also in the previous panel. So I want to bring again the case of community networks and say that it's not only an economic argument in favor, but it's uh, beyond uh, economics, and I will do this through an analogy. Uh, before this, uh, just to say that I work in the Net Commons project, and uh, one of the um, statements of the project is that community networks are very different. They are not just uh, municipal or small companies. There are networks that are created by people on the ground, and they are so different as many different cultures and environments that these 
networks are built. And my analogy is with um, agriculture. And uh, I think it's uh, well understood the trade-offs between uh, industrial agriculture and uh, uh, organic or biological agriculture. I mean, people uh, have uh, clear in their minds that there is a trade-off and uh, they are in favor of the one or, or the other. But I think we, we have not realized today that uh, the, our, uh, our, our online lives are managed by the analogy of the industrial uh, model with the big uh, cloud providers and the big uh, companies like Facebook and Google. And uh, this is not just uh, about service, but it's also about infrastructure. I mean, uh, this dependence on the big providers goes also through the infrastructure that you could see as the soil, let's say, where uh, information is uh, uh, created. And uh, I think that it's not too exaggerated to make this analogy, uh, especially since yesterday's uh, discussions at the European Parliament. And uh, assuming that to some extent it holds, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. uh, the question would be, uh, as we have organic and uh, biological agriculture uh, instead of genetically modified organisms, uh, what would be the analogy of an organic Internet instead of what uh, I call the algorithmically modified data that uh, we consume through these big companies. And, um, yes, the... <laughs> so, uh, the answer is that we don't have, as in the case of agriculture, uh, the example of the past. I mean, what will be the organic Internet we have not... Our grandparents didn't have. So it's not something that we were doing in the past that now we have to go back to and experience what it's a real tomato or all these things. So the, the organic Internet is possible in the future through the technology that is cheaper, through the understanding of people, how it works. So I think it's, the analogy holds. I have tried many uh, layers of it, and I think it's a very uh, valid analogy. And, but what it does not hold is that the, the organic version of it is to be discovered. And uh, to, to make it happen, we should support it. I don't think it will become a valid threat, as somebody said in the previous panel, in the sense that urban gardens cannot, uh, they are not valid threats to Monsanto, but they are really necessary parts of our uh, biodiversity and of empowering community, uh, creating literacy and all these things that we need also for the case of the Internet. And I think we, we should support them as much as we can, exactly because they are not a big threat. They will not, uh, you know, break down the system or something like that, but they are really necessary for what I call the net diversity. And what is the organic version of the Internet today is these community networks mentioned before, like Wi-Fi or Freifunk. I want to stress that all these are very different, and uh, they will not, uh, as I said, uh, connect the whole world, but they really uh, offer complementary services. They fill the gaps in rural areas. Freifunk uh, increases dramatically the access network in Berlin, for example, what Wi-Fi for you will do very uh, difficultly from the top down. So all these uh, community networks are really just helpful. I mean, they, they will make our life better, and they will not uh, bring down any big telecom op operator, and we should really try to, to, to uh, support them. So, yes, they are very different. I don't go into this detail. And I just want to say that this narrative starts uh, gaining tension also in different contexts. For example, the new uh, Next Generation Internet Framework talks about decentralization of power, of infrastructure. This is exactly what community networks offer by construction. Uh, ISOC at the global level invests a lot of effort and hopes on community networks to connect the unconnected. And uh, the, connect, the, the community networks themselves start to organize to share practices and create an ecosystem. So this is an evolution. We, as I said before, we don't have it ready. We have to support it. It's, a, it's an ongoing progress for all this knowledge that now starts being created in different locations to uh, encode it and make it accessible. And there has been recently an open letter to the EU policy uh, organized by NetCommons on uh, how uh, the EU and the regulators can support these networks. And uh, yes, uh, I would finish here just uh, 
to emphasize how important the concept of diversity is. And from all this, I would uh, pick up this design for TASL. One of the architects of the Internet said that the Internet was designed so as not to solve the social and political problems in a unique way, but allow the different societies to negotiate them. So the Internet itself is not a very an imposing architecture about how things will happen. And I think this is very important, and this is what community networks somehow do. They are the outcome of local, social, political, and economic processes that we have to uh, offer to the local communities to, to, to develop. And uh, yes, then I don't know if I have more time. I, I, I just want to give some examples, Guifi, uh, Freifung. And in Greece, we have Sarantapor, which is a small rural network that uh, started through external funding. And uh, it already offers a very good quality with very low price to 14 villages. And what I want to stress is that it's not only about this backbone and access networks, but it's about people learning about what is the Internet, what is infrastructure, planning together their local access networks and feeling empowered, having their children visiting them because they have Internet, and also visiting by us, and they appreciate a lot that they are given attention. Yes, that's all. Thanks. Right, thanks very much. I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions, but first I wanted to ask a follow-up question for Katie. You mentioned um, this as being a lost opportunity, and when we think about the length of time that this has taken, I mean, 10 years since the last time this was um, uh, revised, obviously we don't want to see another 10 years from now before we do this exercise again. Obviously, we're in the process now where changes are around the edges and not, not to the main thrust of the um, proposal. But how soon would you like to see another look at this? And are, are the obligations that are on small providers, are, are they, do you suspect that they'll feel it a little bit more onerously because the changes are coming after a long period of time rather than a constant set of updating? Well, one of the things that we're, I mean, you're absolutely right, look, I mean, and, and, and we recognize this, and again, I mean, I was trying to take it, you know, the, the broader, the sort of taking a step back and take the bird's eye view, right? We, we, do, we do appreciate all of the work and all of the effort that has gone in. We do think, again, that there are some positive elements, right? But I think, I think we also have to be honest. Um, so one of the things that we... Uh, would like to see is, you know, the Commission has to do these five yearly uh, reviews. Um, and so one of the things that we would like to have included that they specifically should be looking at is uh, how appropriate the current sort of governance regime is um, in view of market and technological developments. Because it is, it is one of these, and, and it, it's a huge file, right? And again, as I was saying, Digital Europe has been involved in all aspects because we have interest in all aspects. We have been involved in the whole investment debate, very involved in spectrum, very important for us because we need to harmonize spectrum rules for the equipment that, that our members manufacture. You can't, you know, you just, you need the same, the same spectrum bands, you need the same requirements. Uh, you don't manufacture uh, telecoms equipment for uh, different European markets. <laughs> Ideally, you would like to just have one set of rules globally, right? Um, so, so we understand that this has been a very, um, a very long uh, debate covering a multitude of issues, and it is complex. Um, we do, I mean, we have been pushing not just for the full harmonization aspects, uh, but we've also been pushing for what we call main establishment in general authorization. This is not a foreign concept in EU law. You have it in a lot of single market legislation. Uh, NIS, for instance, has it for, for the digital service providers. Uh, and, and so we think that the time actually would have been ripe, at least for ECS, again, recognizing that with, the, with networks, maybe there the time is, is, is not quite ripe yet, um, to at least start looking at that. So we would like that issue to still be alive, not just because I would still like to continue having a relevant job, <laughs> but, um, but also because we think that it is, it is necessary to make sure um, that Europe continues uh, to, to be competitive and innovative in this area. When will the time be ripe? I don't know. I think, you know, let's, let's have a first review in five years and let's have a particular look at this and, and then we'll see where we are. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a wholesale uh, change. It can be a more gradual and more targeted 
uh, approach, right? So. If, if I may, on the transposition, um, a few lessons learned uh, from us, from ENISA. Um, indeed, I mean, my experience with European affairs almost 20 years now says that Europe, uh, or at least the European institutions, follow a principle-based uh, legislation and gives enough flexibility to the member states to elaborate. And uh, some, in some areas there is somebody who facilitates this process and uh, aims at uh, so that all players uh, f direct to the right uh, point. And in some areas you don't have this, and then you have overlaps and you have all the problems that you mentioned. In the area of cybersecurity, at least, um, we did a lot of work in harmonizing Article 13A. I wouldn't say that we were 100 percent successful, but we managed to bring member states around the table, and we agreed on a lot of things. And by doing this, we avoided the, um, the Commission coming up with implementing acts with additional uh, re regulations that might cost more money for the private sector. Um, so, it is a very difficult process. It takes a lot of diplomacy, it takes a lot of time, but in my opinion it is worth doing it instead of writing top-down all the details. Uh, and if it fails, then of course the Commission can always come with implementing acts and uh, very detailed rules to clarify, you know, open issues. But it is important to let diplomacy you know, play an, an active role in resolving issues. And at least in the area of um, uh, telecom, we have BEREC that can play this role, and in cybersecurity matters, we have ANISA that can also play this role. I wouldn't guarantee to you that it will harmonize you know, properly, but at least give us a try, because uh, give us an opportunity to... to to, to give uh, our, our best, uh, you know, intellectual capacity to, to resolve these kind of issues. And uh, maybe we are successful. You never know. So. Let's take some questions from the audience. We also still have a large amount of our panel uh, with us. Ramon, Maria, Johannes, I see over there, Julia. Uh, so feel free to ask them questions as well. Do we have a first question? <laughs> okay, I will start uh, with a question to Mr. Uzunis. So um, for us as Greens, of course, uh, security is extremely important. We've been great supporters of the NIST directive. At, uh, at the same time, of course, we're great supporters of community networks and so on. So um, I think one challenge when it comes to new legislation for small players is that they learn about it very late. I mean, we're seeing this with the GDPR now. Transposition deadline was quite long, but it is, of course, challenging to implement if the first time you think about it is two weeks before entry into force. So, of course, this is something that we want to avoid with the code. So, um, if you are a community network today and you hear that the, the code is being negotiated and there might be some obligation for, for, in terms of security, um, what, what would you recommend? Like what will INISA do to reach out uh, to, to the small operators and to prepare them to make sure that once the code comes into force that everybody is prepared what, what they have to do and I think this is relevant for small operators, regardless of whether they are community networks or not. But how can we make sure that, you know, the small players, the SMEs, the community networks are not surprised that suddenly there is a, a new obligation? And I just wanted to make one short comment on the question of full harmonization, because, of course, on the end user rights, we do have full harmonization, but it's targeted full harmonization. And the reason why it's targeted is because in some cases, well, member states would not um, accept to have the higher level of consumer protection as the standard for all of Europe. And if we could have that, then full harmonization would be no problem. But I think it's a lot to ask of the European Parliament to lower the standard of consumer protection for the sake of full harmonization because, of course, at the end, you know, it will be the evil EU uh, that will be blamed if consumers don't have the rights they have before. So I think for us it's always been a question for harmonization, yes, but at the highest level of consumer protection. And unfortunately, this is not something that seems to be possible in the, in the framework of the code. 
This is a very good question, and indeed, it's exactly as you said. I mean, the smaller players do not have the capacity to understand the developments, and when they are um, very close to become uh, in force, suddenly they realize that they have to do something. Uh, what we can do, first of all, we started uh, already discussing with the uh, NRAs uh, in the context of BEREC and also within a working group that uh, ENISA runs to understand precisely what it means in terms of security and what needs to be done. So, and we are preparing ourselves. We are waiting for the final uh, document to come. So this means that the national NRAs like, uh, you know, uh, RTR from Austria, Pinetza in Germany and others, you know, they will actually go back at national level and um, start, you know, interacting with the communities, um, elaborating or explaining what it means in terms of security. If there are open issues, so things that have to be agreed across member states, then ENISA will facilitate the dialogue and come up with something, a solution. But my understanding is that in most of the cases that will address the big players. We will miss out the small players. So what we can do to reach out to smaller players is most probably to have dedicated actions. So dedicated actions means that we can have a workshop or a series of workshops with uh, companies like the ones that have uh, presented today and uh, raise the issue. Um, these communities are basically a target of, uh, of a potential attack. Uh, there can be vulnerabilities in the systems that they deploy and um, there might be problems, but uh, there will not be critical problems to the economy, to the society, or to democracy. So uh, it will be a big disruption for these communities, but it will not affect, you know, absolutely the critical infrastructure. So it's very important to bring these communities together to understand the issues. And uh, if there is enough interest from you and from these communities, we can consider, you know, organizing these kinds of workshops, uh, explaining, you know, to smaller players what needs to be done. Um, happy to do that with uh, ISP associations and other uh, entities. Um, yes, so with pleasure. Let me put this question to Bruno and Panayotis in terms of small companies not just all of a sudden understanding their compliance obligations two weeks in advance. How, how do you think small companies can be helped with that the most so that they're ready for the changes? Okay. Um, your, your question is about uh, how the companies can understand, understand in a, early. A, early, mm -hmm. earlier. Um, I think that uh, NRA are the, the best way to communicate with uh, operators. Um, in France, uh, I make uh, <laughs> only uh, with, with what I say, with, with what I know. Um, in, in France, uh, with uh, RCEP, this is uh, NRA in France, um, we have some good communications. They put, they, 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 they send, they, they send to us uh, information and uh, with deadlines, and we we know exactly how, uh, when, and how uh, we have to act. So I think this is a, a good way to work uh, with, uh, with the NRA. But uh, NRA is not, in France, is not uh, able to, to handle uh, security subjects, I think. They are not uh, enough for now. They are not enough, um, n they, don't, they don't have the knowledge for that, I, I, I suppose. So they have to, to be uh, upgraded, <laughs> and, I mean, and um, there is some work. Perhaps also Ramon could answer this on the behalf of GUIF. I want to say for the type of networks that I'm in contact, one of the best uh, approaches that they follow is depending on open source uh, tools. And many of the measures that they have to fulfill are distributedly and very efficiently implemented. So I think this is another dimension that one should invest. And uh, there is this radio directive, for example, that uh, makes the open source development of uh, routing software very difficult. And this would hinder uh, this type of automatic adaptation to threats, to security issues, as the open source community have proved 
through Linux that it's uh, many times much more uh, effective and efficient than uh, even huge uh, companies. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Guifi, I mean, being a bigger player in the community network uh, scene has something more to, I mean, if there is something more to add on this. Well, um, everybody, everybody has to do what, uh, what they're supposed to do. Uh, and following uh, Ezekiel's name, uh, so, uh, Avengers. Uh, yeah, some, somehow proactively and some uh, have to be done in order to communicate that to the people. And all of us and Giffy as well, we can help um, in doing that. But uh, the initiative has to be taken in terms of informing the, the others. We cannot expect the others taking the initiatives because it's not going to happen. And then create that participatory forum and there is a lot of tools that actually can help uh, very much in, and open source is a good, uh, a, a good analogy for doing that and spreading information in a kind of effective way through many uh, communities and so on. Uh, that has to be implemented. I mean, it doesn't happen without, uh, but it could be done. But, and, and, and that initiative needs to be taken. You know, it's, uh, when you are building a community, first thing that you uh, are quite also the community could be horizontal in terms of uh, 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 hierarchy or organization. It should be somebody managing that community, the, the, the community manager, let's say. The manager maybe is not the right word, but somebody proactively addressing to to those companies and looking to their uh, needs and, uh, you know, and uh, I don't know, maybe you are referring also to this kind of, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a job, it's a duty, a duty that somebody has to, to take. And, of course, all of us can, can help in that, in that effort. I mean, it's in the interest of all of us, yeah. Um, just to reinforce this point, uh, to mention what we said in the earlier panel, it's important that this dialogue continues. So then smaller operators, community networks are in the know, and they don't suddenly face surprising obligations out of nowhere, um, and they realize two weeks before the deadline that they have to do something about them. So um, being in, in contact with policymakers and having these exchanges is crucial, and obviously it will help with implementation. Do we have another question from the audience? Yep. Um, hello, my name is Gregor Bransky. I'm a member of Freifunk Aachen, which is one of the communities of Freifunk Rheinland. Uh, we are, as far as I understand, one of those community networks with holding a full RIPE membership, uh, one of the few, I guess. Um, what we would like to point out is that when you come to building communication infrastructure and you want to make the new telecommunication code a fair thing, Please take into account that especially community networks and small and medium enterprises are usually not active in all three areas, like mobile communication, Internet service providing, and setting up open wireless networks. Um, especially the Wi-Fi for You program showed that the implementation of the um, proprietary, proprietary um, hotspot 2.0 standard might lead to a way to subsidize big players who are active as Internet service providers as well as mobile service providers as it would allow for offloading from the phones of big companies, which then would lead to basically small Internet service providers setting up I'm not sorry if I extended my, my speaking time. Um, so th this would lead to the fact that especially, if, if, which is a desirable technical feature, you implement offloading into a public infrastructure, but you do it with a proprietary standard, the small Internet service providers would actually provide an offloading infrastructure to big Internet service providers who do also do mobile services. This can be tackled by either tracking all the user data uh, which is probably leading to GDPR nightmares, so I would please ask you to not do that, but could also be avoided by just implementing an open standard so everyone can use that. 
and not a proprietary one. And I think that especially the European Union has a very formative force when it comes to affecting policies throughout all lower levels of governance um, throughout Europe because small Okay, now I'm, I'm confused. Um, the small municipalities don't have an IT specialist team that can devise an idea how to build an infrastructure, and they will just look to what the European Union is putting out there, and they will take it, and they will not have the personal nor the skill set to check it if they don't have a world-leading university in town. What I can say is that we see a big concentration of Internet, uh, let me say it correctly, we see a big concentration of Internet resources at the hands of very few organizations, and this is something that uh, really Internet society is very, com very concerned about it. In the last meeting in London in March, um, it was widely discussed, and we see with the advent of cloud, uh, basically only a few companies collecting data and somehow developing the Internet in ways that fits their interests. Um, that might be a business reality. We cannot prohibit, you know, this maybe. But what we can do is, you know, somehow foster the – follow the motto of uh, Panagiotis that uh, diversity is, is a good thing and uh, we can have always, you know, other players. So it's important that your communities are supported and it's very important that you are here today. It's an excellent opportunity for you to express your opinion and contribute to this. Um, usually the, the decision makers, you know, focus at the big players. But uh, if we as public organizations like ENISA, for example, can give you a possibility to survive and to somehow sustain these communities and give a, a, a vital uh, democratic value, which is Internet, you know, to people, that would be a really um, very good thing, I think. Just a response, yeah. I'll try to make it brief so it doesn't become a dialogue. Uh, I think one of the most relevant parts for, for common networks is that they do rely on the use of open source software. And it might be a lot of things, one, if you actually ask for providers to also, or for hardware manufacturers like Cisco, please don't take it personal, uh, to actually provide infrastructure that is accessible to open source, uh, to open source networks. We could then, for example, take out-of-life service, uh, out-of-life cycle service devices if they are opened up to develop open source software to run on those. We're ne never going to get into competitive, competitive, any kind of competitive argument with Cisco with running their five-year-old devices in open source software but we can then still provide the services that are needed on a business level. Sounds like a good opportunity for a discussion after the panel. Um, I want to thank our panelists very much for a very interesting discussion. I think we've learned a lot today, and there's a lot to go off of for Julia and for um, other people here involved in these negotiations. So thank you for being a very attentive audience, and have a round of applause for our panelists.